All right, so here we go. All right, um, let me start off. Get some little mess here today. There, there we go. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about AGV navigation um, and digital in inputs and outputs. All right. So the first thing I want to talk about is when we're using the AGV simulation software, there's a couple of uh, key areas that we have access to. Um, we're not going to talk about pulse or analog right now, but I do want you to make note of the digital input section and the digital output section. Um, it's worth noting that what we are essentially simulating again is we are simulating the motor controller. And so our SDC 2160 has a number of digital inputs and digital outputs that we can use. Uh, examples of digital inputs, if I, if I look, thought of digital inputs, you might see things like, um, oh, you could have uh, sensors, you could have switches, um, you know, push buttons, you know, these could all be things that could be considered inputs, right? And digital means that they are one or zero on or off, they're Boolean in nature. The output side, we could have alarm horns. Um, so, you know, if uh, the robot was coming around a corner, maybe it could sound a horn, kind of like a forklift would. Um, we could have uh, lights, you know, LEDs or lights or strobes, um, a number of different things. Or for that matter, the robot could even have something like a, like a solenoid um, with some, or, a, you know, electric valve or something like that, you know, electric actuator that it could, uh, you know, essentially go and pick up a, a device. Um, you know, another one I like up here in addition to the switches for the uh, inputs would be something like a limit switch. So it can detect when it's in the right position. You know, beyond just our magnetic tape, we have a lot of availability. So in the simulator, you know, we will simulate turning on an input by checking one of these boxes, all right? Um, Oh, you know, another. I thought of another digital input. We actually have some encoders that are pre-wired up so we can read motor speed. On the digital output, um, you know, I will, in the simulation software, I'll be able to write to these values, you know, push a one or push a zero into a digital input. Here I'll be able to read, um, you know, what's going to happen with that digital output. Really, in the software, I'm writing you know, to the output and, and watching uh, an alarm horn turn on or hearing it, right? In the software, I'm reading a sensor and then seeing the indication. So from the simulator side, it's a little backwards because we don't actually have a real sensor or a real horn or something like that. Um, but it'll give you some, some good ideas as to what we're up to here. All right. Um, the Robotech 2160, uh, this is actually, I think this is actually a 2130, but our 2160, SDC 2160, looks identical to this to this particular uh, motor controller. So if you look at my Minibot, there are not a lot of components to the Minibot. Uh, essentially, you've got a magnetic sensor, you've got a couple of motors, a couple of wheels, you've got the chassis, you've got the SDC 2160 uh, motor controller, and then you have a lot of cables and you've got a battery and things like that, but that's it. I mean, that's it. The, the motor controller, the motors, and the magnetic sensor, they are the bulk of what we're up to here, right? Um, but on board, we have access to six digital inputs. Now, I will tell you, we don't actually have access to six digital inputs. The reason why is we've already occupied uh, digital inputs one and two and five and six with our motor encoders. So our motor encoders have wires going out to those digital inputs. And then we're able to actually read um, the encoder value. And I, I think we've talked about this earlier in the course. Remember what an encoder is, right? The, probably the simplest version of an encoder would be just to do something like this, like create the, the halves of a, or the slices of a pizza, right? And I've got an LED that's shining at that thing. And as this wheel spins around, the LED is you know, held stationary. But every time one of these little, these little dark areas passes, we break the light reflecting off of that wheel, right? And so I get, in this case, I get eight pulses per revolution. And by doing that, I then know um, I can calculate, you know, the pulses per second, the pulses per minute, which gives me the revolutions per minute with some very, very simple math. And we don't even have to do the math because the encoder actually does it for you. However, we have access. So although four of the encoders are, or four of the digital inputs are occupied, we do have access to DI3 and DI4. 
So if I wanted to measure up a proximity sensor, a radar sensor, an ultrasonic sensor, something like that, you know, if we're thinking safety, um, or if I wanted to set up a limit switch, um, I could get those values using the command get value uh, dn underscore dn3 or get value underscore dn4. And then those values would correspond to me doing something. So remember, we won't get access to one or two, and we won't get access to five or six. We will get access to three and four. And depending on what motor controller you have, you may get access to more digital inputs as well, right? So that's going to allow me to read digital input three and four. And remember, these are Boolean. They're on or off, true or false. Okay. Then I get down to the two digital outputs. So I also have two digital outputs available to me as well. And if I want to turn on one of those digital outputs, I use the command set command underscore D out one. So that would be digital output one, set it to a true or set it to a false or D out number two, set it to a true or set it to a false. And I will receive indication if it's set to a true by this little light turning on or this little light turning on. So I'll actually be able to see that it turns on or off based upon that. All right, now here's where it's going to get a little bit messy, and I will have to demo this for you because um, this is a little bit funky now. So up until now, and we should still do this, um, tape detect. If I don't detect tape, I'm expecting the AGV to stop. So continue to write that chunk of code where I'm either going to detect the tape and I'm going to allow the throttle and the steering to drive the motors, or if I do not detect the tape, then I'm going to set the throttle and the steering to zero. So that's our safety precaution. If I lose the magnetic strip, um, you guys have been doing that for two weeks now. I'm not worried about that. We also have been doing tape position. And tape position, we've been getting it off of this MGT value. Now, this is where it's a little bit different today. Our MGT value said basically this half was negative 50, dead center was zero, and over here was up to positive 50. I mentioned this early in the semester, or excuse me, earlier a few weeks ago, but we haven't used it yet. The sensor is actually divided up really into two halves, left and right. And if you look at the left half of the sensor, really what I'm doing is I'm reading get value MGT1. So MGT1 underscore MGT1, that actually goes from negative 50 all the way up to zero and then underscore mgt2 actually goes from zero all the way up to positive 50. there's a reason why we're going to use these two this week instead of just using tape position if all i want to do is follow a magnetic strip and i don't need to make a choice to turn left or turn right then what tape position is going to give me is it's just going to give me one value between negative 50 and positive 50. So it's just going to look at the sensor as a whole. And oh, by the way, if it senses two halves, it's going to essentially add the two together. So if I sense negative 50 and positive 50, I'm going to get a zero. Meaning if there was a mag strip here and a mag strip here, I would actually get a zero. Um, so, but we've never really had that come up before because we've always just been following one magnetic strip. That's going to change this week. So keep an eye on these two here in a minute. Marker left and marker right. We're going to continue to use those as we need to. So we get the value MGM 1 and 2. These will be the values that will be Boolean, right? And actually, this guy up here should be Boolean as well, right? It's the, two, it's the 3 in the middle here that these are all going to be an integer. So if we talk about what's the data type. Oh, I should be able to spell integer. There we go. These are the data types. Um, so my if i'm just looking to see if the the tape is there that's yes or no that's a boolean true or false the the value from the magnetic sensor whether it's the tape position from negative 50 to z to positive 50 or if it's on one of the two halves of the sensor that's going to be an integer right negative 50 to positive 50 or negative 50 to zero or zero to 50. and then the marker left and marker right that's just telling me did i detect a marker strip, a reverse polarity magnetic strip. Again, that's a Boolean, true or false. So notice, now what I, I think what's important here, let me dis, uh, get rid of this for a second, discard my ink annotations and go back in. What I want you to notice is look at where our AGV is at right now. And if you ever run with just MGT um, and you reach a fork like this, 
right now my value for tape position would be zero because it would add up some, let's say, negative 10 plus 10, and I would get a value of zero. But the individual halves of the sensor, so remember, there's two halves of that sensor. There's this half, the left half, and this half, the right half. And the left half is MGT1. This value, I might say, based upon where it's at, is going to be negative 10. And this value might be positive 10. And you can see really quick that it would be very, oh, not positive 50. Let me fix that real quick here. Pointer. Get my eraser up. There we go. And get back to my pointer. And I need a pen. So a negative 10 or a positive 10. Um, and you can see that the two halves are working because I have two red dots right now, right? And if I keep going forward, which I would if I was just using MGT because it would continue to think it's a zero, these dots would actually be moving further and further out, wouldn't they? And eventually those dots would go off and your, your vehicle would just stop. And that'd be really easy to see how that works. So I'll consider the diagram at white, right? How can we navigate onto the left fork or the right fork um, depending on what maybe a digital input is or something like that? That's what we're going to show you next. All right, so a little bit of an explanation on Lab 4, and then I will do a, a fork demo. I'm not going to demonstrate everything. So again, I've, I've given you, I think, what are the tools right now. Um, but now I want to talk a little bit about what our AGV is going to do this week. So our AGV is going to start right here, and this will be a new, this is a new map for you guys. So I want you guys to, you'll have to download this and get this new map. As the AGV approaches this fork right here, it's going to ask a question, and it's going to say, is digital input 3 on, or is digital input 3 off? If digital input 3 is on, I'm going to take the left fork. If digital input 3 is off, then I'm going to take the right fork. In either case, I'm going to approach a right marker strip where I'm going to wait for five seconds. After five seconds, I'm going to continue on. Whether I came from there or I came from here doesn't matter. Now, when I hit this left marker strip, at this point, I've been traveling with a throttle. So throughout this whole, whole path here, my throttle has been at, I think I've, I've got it set for 250 in the lab. When I hit this left marker strip, step, this strip, what I want you to do is I want the throttle to go all the way up to 750. So I'm going to notice a dramatic change in speed. I'm going to be running slow here. I don't know why I can't write tonight. I'm going to be running slow here, and here I'm going to speed up. I'm going to go fast, fast, fast. And then this right marker strip is going to allow me to go back to my normal speed, and I'll be back down at a throttle of 250. Again, though, if the digital input 3 is on, I'll take this fork. Or if the digital input 3 is off, I'll take this fork. I think what's going to be your trickiest part today is right here. If you take this fork and you have a right marker strip here, this is where I want you to charge. So you may need to build something in. Um, this is where I could anticipate some folks getting minus two. This is a spot that you may want to work on last. You know, I think a lot of the other things that I, I'm showing here are going to be fairly simple to figure out. Um, but I am challenging you here because this is the same marker strip that I'm using up here where it's a five-second wait. But now I'm asking for it to be a 10-second wait over here. So you guys will have to do some thinking on that. and Maybe drill through your, your, um, your actual uh, micro-basic uh, script manual and see if there's something in there that may or may not be able to help you. And if you don't figure it out, it's not the end of the world. I want you to try to drill in a little bit and see if you can figure that out. So let me give you some hints right now, though. Let's uh, let's do a little bit of coding. Um, and I'm going to start off, just going to move some things around here, get, get rid of my pad there and get back to my mouse. And let's get rid of my ink annotations. And I'm going to go back into my... Uh, stuff here. I don't know what code this is, so I'm just going to delete it. Oops. Well, that didn't work out so well. There we go. And we're going to do a new one. All right. So a couple of things as, I, as I'm starting to work on this, I got to think about what am I going to do here? Well, I'm always going to start out with option explicit. And before I do, let's go. Oops. 
No, don't save. What's going on here? There we go. I guess I, I started to type here. I might as well get going here. Option explicit. Um, and let me do a save as real quick. So I've got a, uh, I'll call this uh, ENGR2210 lab4. And I might put my initials on it, EJD. Call it good. And before I get into this too deep, though, what I want to do real quick is I want to, um, and you see, I actually have my mic real basic scripting manual open as well. I just want to show you guys the uh, track for this week. So, uh, apparently I got another window open, I guess. All right. Let's open here. Give me a second. I got a bunch of things open, and I know something's kicking my butt here. Don't need that. Don't need that. Don't need that. Or that. Snipping tool. Nope. Okay. Uh, save. I close that out. Yep, there we go. Okay, now I'm back to where I wanted to be. I, know I had a little hiccup there, but we're fine. All right, I'm going to go now. So what you'll see here is you'll see the track, and I'm going to approach this fork. And the status of digital input 3 being on or off, I can click on that guy, is going to determine whether I take the upper fork or the lower fork. Five-second wait, five-second wait. My throttle set to 250. I'm going to come down here. I'm going to increase my throttle to 750. I'm going to go fast, fast, fast. Slow back down with this strip. Again, digital input 3 is going to determine if I go this way or this way. If I go this way, I need to have a wait here of 10 seconds. You might even say, you know what, I can't figure out that 10 seconds. I'm going to give you a five-second wait there, EJ, just like the rest of them. If you do that, that's great. It'll be a loss of points, um, but it'll be a minimal loss of points. So let's go ahead and start scripting this out a little bit. Um, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to option explicit. I guess I should add some program comments there. I'll put programmer. Uh, I'm going to put that up at the top, though. All right, programmer. I'll put my name, and then, uh, ch -ch 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 -ch. and the next thing I'll do is I'll put in the project. I'll call this lab 004, and then I'll put in like a date and a revision. Uh, we'll do revision one. And the date today is 4-18-2020. All right, now I'm ready to kick off my code. So option explicit is my first command that I'm going to pick. And there's some things I know. And I'm going to simplify today quite a bit. So I'm going to know I, I, know I need a throttle because we've been talking about the throttle going from uh, 250 to 750. So I know I need a, a throttle. That'll be an integer value, so I'll declare it in memory. Um, I know I need to get my tape position if I'm going to if I'm going to be able to navigate. So I need to know what that tape position is. That's just like any of these ones that we've done in the past. Um, that will also be an integer. Um, what's going to be different today, though, is I'm going to break that tape position up into two key pieces. I'm going to have left pause as an integer. And I don't even know at this point if I even need, I might not even need this one up here. It's possible I could get rid of that. I'm going to leave it there for now. But I think I might be okay with just left pause and right pause. So I'll look at the two halves of that sensor separately instead of what we've been doing to now is treating them like one big long sensor. Okay. Um, and then I also need to have my P gain. I probably don't because I, I know what works for my gain, but I may want to be able to change it depending on uh, depending on speeding up and slowing down, things like that. I know I need to have steering in there. That's If I got throttle, then I also need to have steering. I actually kind of like uh, declaring steering up near the top up here because uh, throttle and steering go together, don't they? As integer. All right, so I got all of those. I got gain, you got steering, and then I also, I'm going to call uh, DN3 my, uh, my digital input, and I'll declare that as a Boolean. 
All right, so those are, that's the de declaration of all my variables. Now I'm going to set up my known values, my givens. I'm going to set my throttle, my default throttle value to 250 because that's what it says in the lab. Um, I'm going to set my default proportional gain to negative 2,500. And I like to space that out. The, the computer doesn't really care, but for human readability, I think it's a good idea. And then we're going to go into our, our main loop. So our top and our subs. Uh, so go go sub, update inputs. I'll do go sub, get tape position. I think these are all ones that we've done before. And by the way, if I, if I need something else, I'll add it in later, right? I, I know these are some of the ones I know from the previous ones. I think we had one for follow track. So remember, um, tape position really was the ability just to get the values that I need. Follow track actually um, helped me determine what those, those steering commands were. I'll do go sub drive motors. That's where we could, uh, if we don't detect the strip, we could potentially uh, shut the motors down. And I think that's probably, I'm just going to do those four for right now. I know I'm missing something and that's fine. But uh, we'll do a weight of 100. Go to top. Go to top. And what else we need then? So now we need to actually start talking about um, what we're going to do. So here's my thought. Remember, I, uh, I should save this real quick here. Save. It's good. It's not going to be able to run. Uh, no. Well, I guess it's not going to let me build. Yes, I get it. Um, can I do a... Can I do a... I guess I can just do a build and call that good and should let me get out of here. I guess. Yeah, sure. Um, I don't have a last successful build, but that's fine. So now is where I'm, I'm talking about the ability to come up here and say, okay, if if digital input three is on, then I want you to be going to the left. And what we saw was as this vehicle approached here, what we actually saw was it wanted to split those. I wonder if I could do that real quick. I wonder if I could, uh, that might be something we could try. Let's try, da, da, da. well, trying to keep it simple here. I think the easiest way is just to show you here. So let's let's go back into the code and let's let's actually get the tape position. I think that's the next thing that we need to do. Get tape position. I'm thinking about it out loud, but I can't really show it to you until I build this this uh, this routine. So what I'm going to say is if digital input uh, and we call it DN three is what we called. I'm looking up at my variables. What did I call digital input three? If digital input three You know what we didn't do? We didn't, I don't think we actually got those. Well, we might be okay here. If digital input three equals true. Then we're going to do some chunk of code. What, what I'm going to do to make this easy is I'm going to say that tape position then. Position equals left pause. And you know what we didn't do though? This is the part that's driving me nuts. We need to actually go update those inputs. And we didn't actually update those inputs. So let's let's get those first. Uh, you know, I'm doing get tape position, but I haven't actually updated the inputs yet. So let's do update inputs. I'm getting ahead of myself there. Um, and we need to get a number of things. So if I go back to my PowerPoint, I think I can look up what those things were that we were going to get, right? Um, all right, so digital inputs. So that's how I get my digital input value. I can get uh, DN3. So I can maybe just copy that out. That might be that easy, easy to do. So I can say that DN3 equals 
get value DN3. And I'm actually have that be my last one. And the, the command I'm not positive off the top of my head is the command for, there we go, these two guys right here, left tape position and right tape position. So those, those are my key values right there, left tape position and right tape position. Um, now, mind you, I didn't call it that, though. I called it left pause and right pause. So I need to call that left pause and right pause. So what that means is it's now going to say, okay, I'm not just going to, make this a little smaller here, there we go. Um, left pause equals get value MGT1. So what that means is it's only going to look at this half of the sensor. And right pause is only going to read off of this half of the sensor. You might say, well, why is that important? Well, that becomes very important because I'm going to be able to um, make decisions based upon that, which half I want to look at. I don't have to look at the whole sensor anymore, which is where I was going with this um, get tape position. So I don't know if this helps or not for you guys to watch me to think through this problem. Um, but hopefully this is what you guys are doing too, right? I start to code and I jumped into get tape position. I realized, wait a second, I'm asking for left pause, but I've never gotten left pause. <laughs> I need to go actually read that value and plug it into that variable, right? Because we created the variables for that, all right? But then, now that I've got those variables, I think I should be able to, um, I should be able to return but I also can maybe make a note here that um, this value is going to go from negative 50 to 0. And this value is going to go from 0 to positive 50. That just helps me to think of what, what, is, what do you mean left pause? It's two halves of the same sensor. Um, so now what that's going to do is I'm going to say, look, if that digital input's true, when that's true, I actually want to go off this direction. And so I only want to look at the, the, the part of the sensor that's on this track. So I think you'll see this in a minute here. So tape position is going to equal left pause. I'm only going to look at the left-hand side of the sensor. I'm going to ignore the other side of the sensor. Um, so if, if digital input 3 is true, then tape position equals left position. I think some of you guys are probably saying, oh, well, then that probably means that if it's not true or else, um, then tape position equals right, posi right pause. So then I'm going to look at the other side of the sensor. And I feel like that's going to help me out quite a bit. And then I'll do an end if and a return. All right. I'm just looking ahead here in my notes. I think we're doing pretty good. There, really, there isn't much we, we need beyond this. Um, I tried to cheat last time a little bit, and I think I will cheat today. Um, on my follow track, this is my next subroutine i got to get to, right? On my follow track routine, um, I'm just going to use steering. Steering uh, equals tape position. That's what I'm getting right, times the proportional gain or the P gain, P underscore gain. Make sure I got that. Oh, see, I'd be careful here. This is where I always go back and look at my variables. You can see I capitalized the G there, so I better capitalize the G here. And after I multiply that by the gain, I'm going to divide that by 1,000. And I think that's all I need to do to generate steering. A lot of times um, we might have called it proportional error and then we let steering equal proportional error. Um, I don't think I need to do that. There's no sense in having two variables involved, so I'm just going to call that a return. That's my follow track. And then my drive motors, I'm going to simplify this one for today too, but you guys do need to have two states here. If I detect the tape, I set the throttle and speed, else I set the throttle and speed to zero. For today though, I'm not going to build that in, uh, but no, that I will, I will test that um, by removing a chunk of the track and making sure that your vehicle does stop. So just know that even though I'm not putting it in there, because I want to keep my program a little short for the demo, um, that won't be, you won't have that luxury on yours. You do need to be very, very safe with the code. Um, so 
I will set the uh, channel one uh, for throttle and I will set channel two for steering. And I think I can return. Boy, I don't know if I need anything else. That might be all I need to make this happen. You know what I do want to do? I do want to print the values, though. Um, I do want to look at what those values might be. So let's do a print variables. And we've been doing this, so I'm actually going to have to do a subroutine for this as well. So I'll do it to uh, go sub, and I'll call it print variables. It's, you know, I don't know why I didn't think to put that in ahead of time, but it doesn't matter. It comes for free, right? We can put all the lines in that we want. Um, but I think it's a bad idea not to print your variables because that's a nice little debugging. So I'm going to do print and I'll do a, a colon, or excuse me, a parenthesis. And I'm just thinking out loud. What do we have? We had left pause. Is that the right? So I just noticed something again here. So as you do this, you start to think, oh, I'm going to type in left pause. Notice how I called it a capital L and a capital P up here. And then notice how down here, I guess I did a capital L and a capital P here. That's good. Um, but here I did not. So it needs to be a capital L. I knew I'd done it wrong somewhere. And a capital R. And by the way, it would have told me, right? I'm going to say left pause. Oh, boy, I got fat fingers today. Left pause, I'll put a couple spaces, another colon, then I'll call it left pause. And then I'll do right pause, a couple spaces, and a quote, and then right pause. And then uh, we should be able to do a quote, slash r quote and parenthesis and then we'll do a return and remember what that that uh, little slash r does that's basically a carriage return so i'm putting a little bit of space in between my my things i might even put a little bit of space on the front end of each of these two just so that there's space in between when the variable prints out and when i start the next one i think that's good let me do a build on this real quick i do have an error in line 22 Syntax error, line 22. Go sub drive motors. So uh, line 22, I've got go sub drive motors. That's probably not going to work out for me very well. So you can see how that's nice is to bring that up and be able to see that. Go to build. I got another one, line 25. Uh, da, 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 da. Go to top. What did I do here? Go to top. I think I just had a, a space in there. Now I've got no errors, no warnings. So the beauty of that that compiler, that build, is um, I'll tell you what, it's going to detect things, right? Give you an example, like if I had not fixed that left pause, if you remember I had like a lowercase l in here, um, it's going to build out. It's going to give me, oh, it didn't mind that. Oh, that's crazy. I always think that that's going to give me a syntax error, and I, I'm amazed when it doesn't, but that's fine. So it builds out, and we're good. And now what I want to do is I'm going to start this thing and see what it does. Okay, now I paused it immediately. What you'll see is it's giving me the left position. So basically from negative 50 to 0, and from 0 to 50, the right position. They're both at 0 right now. Why? Because the vehicle is right dead center, right? It's a perfect straight line. I'm going to hit go again. Now, before I hit this fork, what you're going to see happen is the left is going to go negative and the right is going to go positive. So let's see here. Oh, oh, you can see it there. So you can see what happened was I had left position negative 28 and right position positive 29. Now, you might say, well, wait a second. Why did it turn right, though? The reason it turned right was remember what we did in our code. What we did in our code was we said if digital input 3 is true, then we're going to only look at the left position, the negative 50 to 0. But if digital input 3 is not true, then we're only going to look at the 0 to 50. And so what happened was when we went into our, our run now, what you're actually seeing is it's saying, look, um, I'm only reading 
the 29 and the 42. And so it's doing its calculation for its error based upon that. I don't know why I keep losing my... Uh... Oh, come on now. Don't need this. I could have closed all of those there. There we go. Um, so what you're actually seeing here is it's saying, look, only look from 0 to 50. We're not looking at the other half of the sensor. And because we're not looking at the other half of the sensor, my error is going to be between 0 and 50. I think it was 42 when we were looking at it, right? So now what it's going to do is it's going to set tape position equal to this number, right? And it's going to use that to conduct, conduct the proportional gain. And it's going to follow that side. And then it's going to steer in on that particular, um, that particular side. All right. Let me hit save. Get out of there. All right. Let me reset it. And now let's turn digital input 3 on. Digital input 3 is on now. I'll start it up. And I'll try to pause it at, oh, too late. Let me do that again. Try to pause it at the precise right moment. There we, oh God, that's perfect. So now normally what would happen right here is we would say, okay, um, the tape position, if I wasn't using left and right, would be based upon these two numbers added together um, because we're only looking at one data point. And so you'd get a, essentially a value of zero because you got a positive 29 and a negative 28. But now what's happening is it's saying, well, wait a second, your tape position is negative 28. So it thinks it needs to steer this way, which is precisely what we want it to do, right? Um, it's saying, I'm negative 28. I want to put this dot. I'm ignoring this dot. I want to put this dot right in the middle. So in order to do that, I'm going to steer up this way. What did I do here? Oh, I turned off digital input 3. I'm sorry. I got to turn on digital input 3 again. There we go. Now I'm going to steer up that way and follow that line. And if digital input 3 is not on, I'm going to steer down to the bottom and follow that line. So I think you guys can see just by turning digital input 3 on or off. Now, mind you, that digital input 3 can stay on the entire time. And so as this vehicle's tracking around, remember digital input 3 allowed me to take the left-hand fork. Now, I don't have any weights in here or anything like that. I don't have any speed up. I'm going to let you guys figure out all that stuff. But watch what happens when I get to this next fork over here. It's going to follow the left fork again. Why? Because digital input 3 is still on. And it's going to try to keep that left sensor in the middle. Now, mind you, it didn't have to do that much because the right sensor tracked off on that. That was kind of cool. And it won't affect this much. You might get a little waver sometimes with that. Um, but let me, uh, let me start that again now. Turn off digital input 3. And now it's going to follow that right line. Oh, I didn't turn it off. I turned it on again. I'm sorry. There we go. Now it's off. And now it's going to follow that right line down this way. And this is where I would want it to pause for five seconds then come down to the bottom. And I would want it to speed up to a throttle of 750 all the way across to this right hand marker. OK. And that right hand marker then would allow it to um, allow it to resume its normal speed. And go around the bend and around the bend. Um, and I, you know what, I'm okay for the lab if you wind up, uh, I don't think I'm going to, well, follow the lab as it's written. Let's just put it that way. Follow the lab as it's written. I guess this is probably a good time, better, good a time as any to kind of talk about the lab. So lab four. Um, so essentially I got to change a few things here. Oh no, yeah. Uh, vehicle start and stop. Navigation based upon reverse polarity strips. Uh, digital inputs and outputs are used to communicate actions taken in regards to the AGV. For the purpose of the lab, the AGV SIM software will be used to simulate inputs and outputs. Here's some examples of inputs and outputs that we talked about. Uh, Pre-lab, uh, 2160 has six digital inputs. Why can we only use DI3 and 4? Describe how you'd uh, program the AGV to follow a left or right fork. So you've got to try to kind of uh, figure out a way to describe what we just did. Um, describe the purpose of each of the following micro basic instructions. And then in the lab activity. So here's where I've got you on all of these various things. Ensure you have the correct AGV profile. Download the mag track for IO that corresponds to this assignment. Write the code necessary to navigate the map shown below. Ensure the AGV code does not lose the track as it navigates the loop shown below. 
Uh, vehicle must start, stop, navigate according to markers. See grading for specific info. Uh, code should include appropriate comments. Digital input 3 will determine which track it takes. Normal throttle is 250. The increased throttle is 750 along the, the bottom edge. Wait times are 5 seconds. I think I'll end up putting a wait time up here too just to make it a little simpler for you as you're coming around to this resume normal speed. Um, charging time is 10 seconds. Vehicle must stop if the magnetic strip is lost for any reason. Deduction of two points will occur for any incorrect or missed stop, turn, or navigation. And then you can either uh, put another page on here, paste your code down here, or what a lot of people have been doing is just creating a notepad file and sending it to me that way, and either one of those is going to be fine. But like I said, I think... Um, that's a pretty good example of what we're trying to do here. And it's going gonna, it's gonna to be a little bit more of a challenge this week. I think everybody will get the forks down cold. Um, the two pieces that are going to be a little bit of a, a brain tester for you here are speeding up the HV along the, the, south, uh, the south track down here, and then creating a 10-second pause here. And I would tell you, you might not even worry about creating a 10 second at first and just having every stop be a five second. I'll even make this be a five second pause too, just so all of them can start out as five second waits. But then once you get all of those features working, see if you can figure out how to make this a different wait time, even though it's still a right hand marker strip. So with that, I wish you folks the best. I think, uh, I think you've got a lot of work to do for the week. Um, I, I am going to change the due dates this week. Uh, I'm going to, just because I didn't get this one created until Saturday here, um, it'll get posted here Saturday evening. I'm going to make the due date um, Sunday at 11.59 p.m. Uh, I still recommend that you guys continue to work on this throughout the week. Try to get it handed in by Friday. Um, but this will give you a full weekend if you don't get it quite done. I will tell you that... Uh, you're always best off reaching out to me during the weekdays, but I do check my email regularly on the weekends. But make sure you've got a good start on this. Don't wait until 10 o'clock on Sunday night to start this. I will change the due dates for you, but please uh, please get started on it as soon as possible. And if you have questions, by all means, uh, reach out, um, and, and I'll, I'll be happy to give you a hand. Thanks.